podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to a new podcast, The Paddock and the Pavilion with Stephen Wallace. In each show, Stephen will interview someone connected to the world of horse racing or cricket. Hello everyone, I am back to the turf today with Matty Batchelor, who 10 years ago stormed home to an emotional win in the Hennessy Gold Cup, now the Labrooks Trophy at Newbury. Hello, Matty. Hello, Stephen. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. I was looking back, actually, at an old um, clip on YouTube. A young Nick Luck called you Matthew in an interview. My mum was the only person who used to call me Matthew when I'd done something wrong. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've been called worse, I suppose. So Matthew, Matty, yeah. <laughs> Well, Nick Luck did on this interview anyway. So, Anyway, looking forward to our chat this morning about your career. Over 300 winners, I believe. Uh, Carruthers, Coney Gree, and of course, Wocket Boy. That was the, the worst bit to actually learn before I came on this podcast. <laughs> but you, you can do it a lot better than that. But let's yeah, start I've had with... plenty of practice, Stephen. <laughs> you have, yeah. Well, let's start with Carruthers and, and a bit of history first. I, I, was look, I looked up, you wrote him 26 times. You must have known him well, his quirks and his and his qualities. How did how was the best way to ride him? I mean, Bradstocks used to ride their horses. They all used to be very similar. Always front running tactics. That was their that was their way. As for as for quirks, he, he didn't have any. He was so straightforward. You you could have put a, a kid on him at home. He was just he was just an absolute legend, Stephen. You know, when we first got him and. He was running out. I think out of them times, I think there wouldn't be many times I wasn't out the first four on him, I don't think. Be interesting to see that, to look back. So, yeah, I don't think there was many times. I didn't ride him once because I was injured. A young lad called Matt rode him at Haydock. And then the other time, strangely enough, is when the season before he ran in the Hennessy, he, he didn't he didn't really have a great season for him he, he looked a bit he just didn't look he didn't feel himself he didn't look himself and he ran poorly and then his first rain back run back was at Cheltenham and the only uh, they wanted to try something different and I got dropped off him believe it or not and Noel Feely rode him and then the next run was in the Hennessy and I, I did think I was well, I, I wasn't going to ride him. That's I, I'd been dropped off him for Noel. That was it. Noel was riding for Paul Nichols in the race. And I remember Sarah ringing me up and asking me a, a few conversations and asking me, oh, just what do you think we should do? And I sort of, sort of said to her, look, I, there's no one better than knows him than me. And I, I think I should ride him. So... She sort of went back to her, because there was a big syndicate of people, went back to them and said, look, we want Matty to ride it. I, th- I think there was a, there was a couple in, in the syndicate that wasn't, wasn't keen. They sort of expressed their feelings and didn't want me to get back on him. And, and then I think the majority voted, yeah, OK, we let him ride it. And, yeah, as I say, so I sort of went out there and I, I sort of knew that, there was a couple of people that wasn't keen for me to ride it, but I'd had that much, I'd had that many rides on him. I knew if he was right. You I, knew him I, well, I, didn't you? I knew him well. I was just going to ride him. I'd always rode him. And if he was good enough, he would win. And, but yeah, I, I had nothing to lose really, because I knew they didn't really want me on him anyway. But he was a quality horse. So looking up, he came for, before the Hennessy when he'd come fourth in the 2010 Cheltenham Gold Cup. What what was it like riding in the Gold Cup on him? Oh, that was that was brilliant. Imperial Commander won, and of course I'd I'd made the running in the in the Gold Cup, and it was it was like days like that. I mean, I remember I, I got I got a, I got a framed picture now. Actually, I've got a race card signed by all the lads who rode it. I've got I kept the number cloth, and then there's a picture. I think it was first circuit. There's there's Rick Carruthers, there's Denman, Cool Toe Star, Imperial Commander. We're all jumping the fence, and I mean that's what that's what you that's what you're going racing for to be involved in days like that. I mean, yeah, to win on days like that is extra special. But even to be involved in a 
in a day like that to go and ride in the Gold Cup. And he and he this he ran well. He's we got to uh, the fence at the top of the hill and they come past me and I sort of filled him up down the hill. And then going towards the second last, I saw Willie Mullins Hill's call dying coming back to me and I thought, jump the last year, I've got a chance of being third in the Gold Cup and running up the running all the way. And I thought, oh my God, I'm going to be third in a Gold Cup. And I started to work out my percentage like everyone does. <laughs> and still pushing, by the way, I might as well add. And then a little blur come beside me and it was Mon Moe coming to gym me for third place. But to walk into, even to walk into the fourth spot in a, in a Gold Cup to hear the roar of the others, but just to sort of go into that enclosure, that's, there's days like that you don't, you don't forget. Well, let's take you back then to the 26th of November, 2011. That's nearly 10 years ago now. Uh, what did you think were Carruthers' chances at Newbury that day? I mean, he ran well. He'd finished second at Cheltenham, first run out, and it was, I think it was only two weeks after. So it was quite quick to sort of running back in a competitive handicap like that. And as you say, it's one of the toughest handicaps to win all season. But Sarah had said he, he, he felt well in himself. And he was, I think he was fancied by a lot of people. He was quite well weighted. I think, I think at the top of my head, I think he was only carrying about 10-3 or 10-4. 10-4, I think it was. Yeah, yeah 10-4. And we just thought if we, we'd bounce out, we, we'd make most of the running like we always did. The only thing with him then, at that stage, he was, whereas before he used to line up and jump and go, so towards the end, he was sort of, not, he wasn't being lazy or anything. He was just sort of, to get him up there when there was plenty of pace, if there was more horses to, more willing to line up, he sort of, sort of just dwelt it a little bit. But we, we got away, we had to sort of roust him. They, went, they did start quick. I think we missed... We might have missed the second or the third and put us back a little bit more. And just going down the back straight, I had to make a decision. We jumped the last fence and I was I was sort of back in fourth or fifth. And I had the inside and I needed to make a decision. And I sort of rousted him up to get right down the inner. And sort of by the time I'd come out going to the cross fence, I was in front then. And then once he'd got out in daylight... He started, he, he was one of those horses, he sort of, he was a little bit claustrophobic. He didn't like to be involved. If he was stuck in the crowd, he, he didn't like it. But once he got out in front and Newbury at the cross fence, he just got into a rhythm then and he was just, he just loved it. Yeah, he just absolutely loved it. He jumped from fence to fence and then we turned into the straight. And then when you've been in that, when you've been in front that long, I think we jumped the ditch. I thought, oh, it's only a matter of time before something sort of come past me. And I knew I knew Timmy would be a danger on Great Endeavour because Timmy was going to give him a typical Timmy Murphy ride because he was doubtful. He was a doubtful stayer to stay that trip. And Timmy held on to him and held on to him the last minute. And I sort of saw him out the corner of my eye. But I, I think he did stay because as soon as we jumped the second last, my fella picked up again and we went away well in the end and won it well. Yeah, you, know, you won by three and three quarter lengths, and uh, yeah. obviously a very big race. And you always get some good runners in that race. And uh, looking up Neptune Colonge, who went on to win the Grand National in 2012, right, yeah. was in the race. And also the giant bolster, who was forever getting placed in the Gold Cup, also ran in the race. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, fair along the Phillips Hobbs. He used to, he was quite a consistent horse as well. And, and it was an emotional win for you. I was reading that it was the anniversary of your. Mum passing, I think, six years before um, the day in 2011. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we was mum passed on, on the Hennessy day. And I actually, I had a ride that day. It was Timmy Murphy won it on Dave Johnson's horse. I forget what it's called. Not comply or die. Anyway, Timmy Murphy had won it. But I'd rode, I'd rode there in the first race I'd had a ride for. Jamie Polman and I was I was driving home yeah I'd rode in the first race I was driving home and I'd run with dad because mum was in hospital and I'd I rang him up just to see how she was yeah so I got I got the news on the way on the car home but yeah so it was yeah it was good it was 
a very poignant day, yeah. So it was good to sort of go and ride. Oh, it's good to ride a Hennessy winner, but it just seemed it just seemed nice as it was on the anniversary. And also with um, Lord Oaks's connection as the the breeder, he wasn't well at the time, so he wasn't at the races as well. No, no, he was watching it at home as well. Yeah, John. I mean, John. He was a he was a good loyal supporter of mine, and we had some. It's a great time, especially in, in early years when we was over hurdles and brothers was winning over hurdles at grade twos at Warwick and he won at Bangor one day. Yeah, John yeah, John was a, a real great supporter of racing and a great supporter of mine. Well, let's go back to your beginnings. We've got we've got quite a long way to go back. Um, uh, how did you start in, in racing yourself? Coming from Brighton. I know, yeah. It was it was it wasn't it was an accident, really. It was like I used to. So my parents' house is literally. It must be three hundred to four hundred yards away from where they pull up at Brighton, the, across the winning line, across the road. So my parents' house is literally down the road from there. Now, going to school, junior school, senior school, I didn't have a clue that we had a race course literally that close because I'd be out the back door, school, back from school, out in the street, playing football. That was it with my mates. Racing had never, ever crossed my mind. Only when I used to go down to a grandparent's house, granddad used to love watching racing, so I'd sort of watch it with him and just to spend company with my granddad, really. And then we'd, I've got family in Ireland and we always used to go over and visit around Christmas time or during the summer and stay over for a week or so. And then this one time we was all sort of scratching about, wondering what to do. And my cousin said, oh, well, I've got a friend who's got a few horses. We'll go up and see him. Went up and see, saw him and then we just he tacked a few horses up. We all jumped off and went off and arrived. Only walking and all of a sudden I said, oh, I'd like to sort of have a sort of canter and a gallop and, just sort of, yeah, went off and done a bit of galloping and a bit of cantering. I was, well, I'm still small now, but I was very small at the time. And he said, oh, have you ever thought about becoming a jockey? And I said, like, no, didn't really sort of have a clue what it was on about. And he said, oh, you're a right size, this and that. And then sort of came back and then looked locally. And Gary Moore's dad was literally five minutes up the road from bang opposite the mile start at Brighton Racecourse. So I just started working up there weekends saturdays and sundays and sort of learning how to muck out and just do all them jobs and then eventually yeah there we had an old pony up there called clue and obviously the kids were very young then but i think josh wasn't born when i first started all the other kids were young so yeah i started having lessons on the, the pony and then eventually there's always every yard's got a quiet all so that everyone can ride so then i was riding out in the string and just yeah, just progressed from there, and then started doing a bit of schooling, and just I was I was never natural. I had a good mate of mine; he used to work there at the time. My dad's, funny enough, my dad's best mate who built the houses where they lived. His son used to ride as an amateur, so we literally lived six doors away from each other. So he worked there at the time, and he was he used to teach me to ride. And like my almost dad used to say, like, "Oh, how's it getting on?" and he, <laughs> He didn't have the art to tell him. He said, oh, he, he kept saying to his dad, he said, he, he hasn't got it, this kid. He, he's not the best. Uh, but I, I worked hard at it and I was very manufactured and I, I managed to forge a career out of it. So so do you remember your, your first ride in, in the 1994-95 season? I do. It was at Windsor. It was a horse called Run to Orbon. And it was lovely owners called the Keenans and I used to look after one of the first also I used got to look after was a horse they used to run on a flat called Invocation used to run over seven furlongs and I used to look after their horse and there was always very good the owners used to come in on a Sunday and oh yeah I, I just I, I looked after him used to lead him up all the time and when Charlie said oh would he be able to ride your horse at Windsor I think they knew it was it was a. It wasn't one of their better ones, put it that way. And they was they was happy to give me a ride around Windsor. And who were you riding for then? That was for Charlie Moore. 
Gary's dad, yeah. So yeah, that was uh, that was the first ride round well, Windsor ra- Windsor Racecourse. But that was quite lucky for me, Windsor, because I that, I had my first ride around there. I had my first winner around there. I was going to ask you when you had your first winner. So it was the same course. Yeah, yeah. it was the same course on a horse called Narawali. I think that was nineteen ninety six. The first winner, but he was. It was a shame. He was a, a Rolls Royce. He was. He had a very big engine. He just had. He just had glass legs. I actually rode him in. We finished third in the big William Hill handicap hurdle at Sandown one year, and then he went. He went on to run, finish sixth in the county hurdle at Cheltenham. So he had. He had a lot of ability, but he had he had glass legs, unfortunately. So yeah, that was. And I also had the first ride over fences. Round there over a. A big chaser called Be Surprised. Again, he was he was, he was okay, but he was he was just a, a real safe conveyance. And it was funny because the day I rode my first chase ride, it was in the week, it was it was on a Saturday, I think, and Charlie he, he was talking to me in the morning at breakfast. He said, Right, he said, because I'd also had Gary was down at the yard by then, he was working there as well. And I'd got my flat license as well. I'd got an apprentice license, so I was riding a couple on the flat as well because it was quite light, just to sort of tidy myself up a bit. That didn't work. <laughs> and so Charlie said, "You can go to. You've got a choice. You can go to Lingfield and ride in the apprentice race, five furlongs, and ride my horse called Lift Boy, or he said you can go to Windsor and ride in your first chase over three mile." A bit of a difference was, there. A lot of difference, yeah. And the sprinter was had a real good chance of winning because he'd won he, he'd won a few. And I was like, oh no. And obviously I, I'd rode over hurdles. So the next phase I wanted to ride over fences. And this horse was like, he was an old schoolmaster. So he said, Oh, he said, I haven't think about it. He said, Let me know what you think. So I'd I'd come out and Gary had got the gist of the conversation and he came up to me, he said, right, he said, go back in there. He said, tell my dad, he said, you can ride in the first at Lingfield. He said, and you will easy make it to Windsor for the three o'clock, the handicap chase. He said, you, you're it, you'll do it easy. Not a problem. So like, I was quite, at that stage, I was quite sort of scared of Charlie because he, he, he sort of, he'd tell you what he thought and, so I said, oh, Mr. Moore, I said, I was just chatting to Gary. I said, he, he thinks I'll be able to two, I'll be able to do the two sort of races. He said, I'll be able to ride in the first and I'd have, have plenty of time to drive to Windsor. He's like, no, 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 you're not doing it. One, No, you're not doing it. And I sort of started muttering and, <laughs> and then luckily Gary come in and he said, he said, Dad, he said, you've got plenty of time. He said, you'll be able to go to Lingfield get in the car and he'd be able to go to Windsor and ride in the three mile handicap chase. He said, and Mr. Charlie reluctantly agreed. He said, if you don't make it, there'd be trouble and all that. But I had plenty of time. So yeah, it was great. I went to Lingfield, rode in the apprentice race over five furlongs and won that and got in the car and and rode in my first three mile handicap chase for Windsor and finished fifth. Oh, so you won the first one, but what? What? Are, what are you not see that done today, would you? Some, well, you can't do it today. You oh, can't ride. You it can't do it today. Yeah, yeah. That, but, I, don't, I don't think there many be done a one a five furlong sprint and then went rode in a hand three mile handicap chase. <laughs> but even when you could do it, I don't think many people would have ridden in two different uh, no. formats on the same day. The only one I thought would might have done it would have been Vince Slattery. Do you remember Vince? No, no. So you think he might have done that? Yeah, good lad. He, he's probably be the only one that stands out in my mind that would have probably rode on the flat and gone on road jumping. So when did you then decide to concentrate on um, uh, riding over the jumps? I think, because I'd, I'd had a few rides over jumps by then, and I'd sort of, I'd got the, I'd got the bug then. I, I'd, I'd got much more buzz out of riding over jumps and riding on the flat. The flat was sort of purely to try and tidy me up a little bit, sort of the different speeds, just to help me really. But yeah, I was sort of, I was hooked on, on jumping. That was, that's where I wanted to go. And yeah, I think if someone had said, 
do you want to go on the flat? I, I, I think I would have declined because, yeah, I'd, I'd, I was hooked by them. And when did you then get tied up with um, Sarah and Mark Bradstock? So, yeah, I was at Gary's. I was at Gary's, I think it was a good few years there. And then before Bradstock, so I was quite lucky. I got on Henrietta Knight. I had a runner at Newbury one day and she wanted to claim off it. I was claiming five then. And my agent, Dave Roberts, he said, like, I'll put you in for this ride. Hen wants to claim five off it. And so lucky for me, went to Newbury, rode this horse and and it won. And that was great and got on well with Hen and Terry. And they said, look, if you would like to come and ride out a couple of days a week, uh, moving forward and give you some more rides. So, yeah, I started going in, riding out for Hen a couple of couple of days a week so I was up in Lambourne and then I wrote a few I wrote a few winners for Hen and Terry and they 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 helped me a hell of a lot as well like Terry Biddlecombe and Hen's background and we used to school every week Yogi Breisner was coming in helping the horses but he was helping the jockeys at the same time and I it, it helped me so much to improve over an obstacle and sort of took me forward again. And then through that association, then the Bradstocks it was at Fontwell one day and they had a spare. Someone had got injured or didn't turn up and they had a horse running. And my valet, she, they said, oh, who have you got? And they said, oh, we got Matty Batchelor and Andrew Thornton. Obviously, they hadn't heard of Matty Batchelor, they heard of Andrew Thornton. So Andrew Thornton rode up the horse. I forget where it finished, but I don't think they were... I don't think they were too pleased the way he rode it. Anyway, a few weeks later, I was running again at Newbury. So Dave, my the, the agent again, said, oh, we got Matty Batch, you can claim whatever off it. So they gave me a chance at Newbury, and the horse ran all right. It, it didn't win, but it ran well. And they said, oh, we can come in, start riding out. And so I did. So the association started with them, started riding out. Had a bit of luck, rode a few winners for them. And, yeah, I mean, listen, they've... Going forward, they took me to that. They took me to the next level, just with the the quality of horses that I was riding, and I was competing. Well, I was competing at Cheltenham, I was Newbury's, Ascot. So I was going. Yeah, you had a there. festival winner. I said festival winner in 2000, 2005. Five. Yeah, yeah, King Harold. Yeah, yeah, he was. He was. He he had an engine. He was. That was a funny story as well because he was. He was very. He was a good jumper, but he was clumsy. He would he would just sort of throughout the race, he would just lack concentration. And I remember I rode him first time out at Newbury over fences. He fell. And then the only one to try the only had horses was Nicky Henderson. And so Andrew Tinkler rode him next time out at Plumpton. And he was coming to the he was coming to the last. He was going to win. And this, I think this is where I got lucky because he was going to win the race. He had it in the bag and he went to the last again. Momentary lapse of concentration fell again. So he had two Fs by his name. So everyone got scratching their heads. And so Sarah and Mark sent him up to Newcastle. And all the northern jockeys said, We're not getting anywhere near this. Southern horse coming up here has got two Fs by his name. They didn't want to know. So by well, the process of elimination, I got back on it because there wasn't many, there wasn't many people queuing up to ride him. He ran well, finished second. Then he went to Newbury and I won on him. And then yeah, Weatherby, we ran well again. And yeah, so he started jumping well. And then before Cheltenham, I thought, I honestly thought, I, I honestly thought I'd get jocked off him. Because I thought the owner's got association with Henderson, he might want Fitzy on him or and I thought, oh, there's a good chance here I'm going to get jocked off. And, yeah, a week before, we had a good session with Yogi Breisner. And we was ending in the, what, what was called the RSA at then. We was ending in that race and the novice handicap, because we might not have got in the novice handicap. So we declared for the RSA, and then we got into the novice handicap. So we had to non-runner him in the RSA. And then, yeah, then running the Juicens handicap chase. And he was... He was absolutely exemplary that day until the last he never put a foot wrong he was he was class he was he nearly fell on a bend 
because as I say, he was quite clumsy. He nearly tripped over after the first couple of fences. And then after that, it was foot perfect, foot perfect until the last fence. He jumped it well. We just got in close to it. He jumped it well. And as he landed, his, his foot slipped again. And I, I nearly fell off it. I jinked, he jinked to one side and I was hanging out the side. Managed to get back on. I'd lost the stirrup, kicked one stirrup belt, and managed to kick away with no stirrups. And we beat Lap Dudel. And well, it was a, yeah, I had a gentleman winner. And then because I'd nearly fell off it, and kick me irons out. I won Ride of the Year on it as well, so I won a Leicester, so it's a double bubble. <laughs> and of course, the other other horse she rode for the Bradstocks, which is uh, so well known, um, Carruthers' half brother, Coney Gree, you ra- rode him in his first six rides, um, so first six races, and won four four times. Um, how good a horse was he? Oh, he was the day. I first got him at Utoxeter. In a yeah, I was looking up. You know, the first time you rode him at only when I was doing some research this morning. Actually, you first rode him at Utoxeter on the twenty fourth of November, two thousand and eleven. That was two days before you the rode Hennessy. the brothers in the Hennessy. Yeah, yeah, and it was it was it was things sort of wasn't really going as well as they had been for the Bradstocks, because we'd had a few winners, had a few winners, and things were going all right, and then we'd had another few horses, and it wasn't really, it wasn't really happening, really. It just, we'd had a few horses not run well, and things like, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't going well, and then all of a sudden, Tony Green won at Utoxeter, so it sort of, but it restored everyone's faith, should we say, that Matty maybe be able to ride still, and then after the Hennessy, on the Saturday, that was it then. It was sort of maybe kept me in a job for a bit longer. <laughs> but yeah, he he won his bumper well. I think then we ran in new a big competitive bumper at Newbury. And he ran well. He just he was just I think he was a bit bit over the top. He just needed a break. So brought him back out the following season. And we went back to Utoxita for his first novice hurdle race around Utoxeter, and we obviously I'd schooled him, and he was he was just from day one he was just awesome, and so was the Carruthers, all that sort of family, or Cave Tara, they all just seemed to have natural ability of jumping hurdles or fences. We went to Utoxeter again, usually as Brad Stocks wanted to jump out in front. He jumped out in front, and I remember turning into the straight for the last time and I had to convince myself that I'd I was doing the right thing because I had convinced myself that I'd gone too early there was another circuit to go because I was that far clear I just I had to go back in my head how many hurdles I'd jumped and then I got to the second last and heard the comment it's only because I heard the commentator say we're approaching the second last that so I knew I hadn't made a massive boo-boo and I, because I was I just couldn't believe how far clear I was. It was it was a great performance and it was I was I was just like well we have got something special here. And then and you, you won at Cheltenham with him as well, didn't you? Yeah, his next run was at Cheltenham in a grey two, and I thought obviously obviously I knew that he'd felt that he's he had all the attributes. He, he felt like a good horse. I personally, I thought he was a very good horse. And then to go to Cheltenham in a grade two, I thought, well, this is a, we could have won another novice somewhere first, but we've stepped straight up to grade two company. It was quite a competitive race. And again, he, he just, he absolutely destroyed them. It was, on, it was over two and a half on soft ground. And he, he just, he galloped them into the ground. I remember the lads afterwards coming back in and they all thought I'd gone. They all thought I, went, I was going quite quick, but I, I was just. And that's always a sign of a good horse. I felt like I was going no gallop at all. He quickened up the hill, and I had I had so much left. And we went back there and done it again in another grade grade two. Oh, so we won on the old course and the new course. So yeah, he was just. He was an absolute pleasure to ride. He was just. He was always gonna. He was always gonna go to the top because he was just. He was Carruthers' half brother, but he just had that little bit. Carruthers was, I always said it, Carruthers was 
he was the one that you would you want him in the trenches with you. You know, he would run through a brick wall for you. He was tough. He was tenacious. He was just he would give you everything. But Coney Gree just sort of it came easy to him. He just had that that little bit of just that little bit more extra class and sort of Carruthers had it. It came easier to him. A bit like a, a George Best who was naturally gifted and footballer came easy. But then you'd have a Carruthers who was like, I don't know, another footballer, but who, who made it, done well. But didn't but have the natural he, ability. Yeah. He didn't have the natural, yeah. natural ability as, as, as Coney Green. But yeah, he was, they were both. I was very fortunate and very lucky to be associated with all of them horses, King Harold Carruthers. Coney Gree, and they had plenty of other horses that won on, on days as well, and I'll be forever grateful with the winners they gave me. And people often ask me now, oh, oh, you should have had a you should have had a gold cup winner. I said, Well, I don't look at it like that. I'd I drove for them for nearly 10 years. We'd had some great days. I still see them now at the races, sometimes see them at Olympia where their son competes. I've never fallen out with them. That is how racing goes. When things don't go well, people like a change. They like to change jockeys. And that's what happened. I, I had numerous good years with them and I will be forever grateful of what they've done for my career. And, and I mean, I'd, I was, I wanted to always have a ride over the national fences. Never had rode in the national, but I rode in the top of them. And that was because of them. They had a horse that run in the top of them. We finished third and... I've got a picture on my wall of me jumping the Grand National Fences, which to me is just, that was one of, of all the winners I rode, to me, that was one of my best days ever on the back of a horse, is getting around that course and finishing third. It was, it was just, it was amazing. And that's, that's what they done for me, the Bradstocks, you know? So it's, yes, you, you watch Coney Green win a Gold Cup. Are you a little bit disappointed? Yes, she was, because to be that close and in touching distance of to win the Blue Ribbon event, of our sport but it was it wasn't though I was jocked up I wasn't jocked off it 24 40 hours before and someone else rode it I hadn't rode I'd never rode the horse over fences I'd never had I'd never schooled him over fences so that was it was they'd moved on everyone had moved on and, and I rung them up and congratulated them and it was listen it was fine it was glad to see that what we thought we had over hurdles that he would go on and be a top top class horse we were all proven right. So it, it was just, it was just great for them. Well, thank you for those uh, um, insights. And do you ever see Carruthers and Coney Gree now? Where are they both? They're still up at the yard, but Bradstock's. And I don't, like, I keep saying, I've got a, I did ask if whenever Carruthers retired, I did so ask. He went him. point to point in, didn't he? Carruthers did. Didn't yeah, the, yeah, Lily, their daughter, won a point to point on him. And uh, I saw a video not so long back, actually. They had visitors at the yard, and he's still in the yard, brothers. And they just, I think they had a, a little kid, only, I think it was about two or three, and they, they plopped him on Carruthers, and he was just walking around the yard. I mean, he was, he, he was just an absolute gentleman. He was like, he was, he was the best. And unfortunately, King Harold, he, he passed the other day because a, a girl, they gave him away. And a girl had him, maybe she was competing him in shows and all that. And uh, yeah, he he lost the, he passed away the other day and she was she'd asked Cheltenham, she'd she had him cremated. I think she's gonna they've kindly let her spread some ashes on the race course for him. So so it's good, yeah. Well, you've also got the unique uh, achievement of winning a Grand National, a champion hurdle and a derby. Now you want a derby <laughs> in Jersey and when a Grand National and a and a champion hurdle in Sweden. How on earth did you do all those three? Again, that was just just through bumping into people and being in the right. I mean, I think racing is being in the right place at the right time. And I got I'm going over to Norway. I had friends, lads have been going over there for years, and because they always used to fly jockeys over there. And again, it was Jim Colotti. Best mate fame. He was going. He was going to ride. At, he was going to ride in Norway. He couldn't make it, so he's changed his mind the day before. A good friend of mine used to ride over here. He went over to America. Had a lot of success. Was Chevy Ice Peru. He said, "Oh, I'm going to Jersey tomorrow. Batch, do you fancy coming?" 
I said, right, I said, I've got to go to school. But if I can get out of schooling and come to Norway, I said, I'll do it. So I rang up the trainer and it was Jim Wilson. Do you remember Jim Wilson? This is Little Al. Little Al. Yeah, Jim yep. Wilson, yeah. So I rang up Mr. Wilson and said, look, I've got a chance to ride in Norway. Is it right? Can I ride to school next week? He said, yeah, yeah, no worries. Go to Norway. So I went to Norway, got on a horse. It, it won. So I ended, up, I ended up working over there for two months, going over there. Rode a few winners over there. They took horses to Sweden. That's hence how I got to win the Swedish Grand National and Champion Hurdle. So, yeah, that was good. And then, yeah, Jersey, that was just through a friend, a mate of mine used to work at, down at Martin Pipes, Gordon Schenkin, and he knew Jamie Moore. And he asked Jamie to go over there initially. And Jamie was quite busy. He said, oh, why don't you ask Batch? Batch would go over. So he, he started getting me over to Jersey. So, yeah, rode right into Jersey. The Jersey Guineas won the Derby and won, won three champion hurdles three years in a row in Jersey. <laughs> there's not many Alex, people. One, no, one for Sir Alex Ferguson. <laughs> well, there's not many people who have done some of the things you've done, what, with this um, uh, five furlongs and then then uh, doing a chase on the same day and winning, winning, a, winning a Jersey Derby and, um, and, and a Guineas. Um, yeah, but I've got to mention my CV would look good. It, a guinea, it would, wouldn't it? Three champion hurdles, a grand national. People would think I'd good, and then they see what country it is. <laughs> but I've got to mention. Um, I'll say it again now. Walk it, Roy, and and the videos with Mark Goldstein. How how did whose idea was that? It was that, again that just come up. We was riding out one day uh, down in Sussex at Sheena Wests. And we had a couple of horses, and one who was called Roy, that was his nickname, he used to be he used to be very strong and he was sort of be a, a bit of a tough ride, but in a certain area he was he used to canter over to the gallop and every horse just used to hack over there quietly. So I said to Mark one day, I said, I think this bit, I said, I reckon I could go across here with no hands. I know he's normally keen and strong. I said, but I reckon I could go across this bit with no hands. So he called the bluff. So we done it and he filmed it and then sort of put it out there. Then the following week, I was just walking down the gap, we going to the bottom of the gallop again. And he said, oh, do you reckon, do you reckon you do it up, the, going up the gallop flat out? So when we started chatting it and we were, we were calling him, yeah, he could be a rocket. <laughs> so then we just went up the gallop, flat out, took the hands off. Then we called him Rocket Roy, just to, yeah, just to be different. <laughs> and then, yeah, it just took off. And we put it on Facebook, shared it on Facebook. And we were doing it for about, maybe about five years. Yeah, five years. And then I was going to say, have you stopped doing it now, have you? Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's just sort of, it came sort of, not, it was time consuming, like obviously, because. I wasn't, when I sort of, I hadn't finished riding, but I was lucky enough to get offered a job, a sales job. And like normally, if there was these jobs come about, you'd have sort of 15, 20 people applying for them. But just because I knew the people involved, I got a chance to have a trial. They liked me and I've been, I've been there ever since. So I had, I had work commitments. So like with racing, you can sort of juggle it, but then I had to sort of work three, four days a week. So it was, it was getting more and more difficult to sort of get stuff out there, good content out there. I mean, it, listen, it went, it lasted five years and it was good. It was just, it's, it was like anything. I suppose anything It's you don't really want to, you'd rather sort of finish and people still want you to carry on rather than sort of un, unstay your welcome sort of thing and, and get yeah. worse and people go, oh, that's not very good. It's not as good, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's like if you do a stand-up routine, isn't it? You almost you almost want people wanting more. So, I mean, there's an option there. It's like we've say we've had a bit of break and a bit of work commitments and things like that. But it's it's never. I'd never say never. Do you know? It's. I mean, people as people still come up to me now. Are you going to start it again? Are you going to come back? So it's it's yeah. It's not totally out of not totally lost. So you never know. And is that the sales job that you're doing now that we spoke off air about? That's right. Yeah, yeah. I work for a company called Chanel and they do 
it's a generic drug. It's a, called animal drugs. So small animal, large animal, equine. Yeah. So just um, I've got an area that I go around and yeah. So it's it's Tony McCoy's father in law's company. And you're still having the occasional ride. I keep looking on racing posts. Yes, I was the at odd Plumpton, ride. Yeah, I was at Plumpton the other day. I'm off to obviously this is being recorded, but I'm off to Ascot on Friday. I've got a ride there Friday, so the nineteenth. Yeah, so got one. So for you, you still in, you still enjoy having the odd ride? Then you're still oh, riding out as well. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I, I ride out most days. I, I'm not getting any younger. I try to keep myself fit play football once or twice a weekend and uh, try and play squash. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, yeah, I'm not ready to sort of to give up yet. And there's a couple of people that still give me rides and yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoy it. And it's great going back in the weighing room and sort of having a laugh with the lads and seeing old friends like the valets. And I mean, yeah, look, most of the people I used to ride, ride with now are, all sort of retired. I think there's, I could sort of count on one hand, like your, like your Scoos, your, your Moors, your Jacobs, your Gold Seeds, all that. I go, I was in there the other day and the people come up to me and say, all right, Batch, and they walk off and I say to someone, who was that? <laughs> I just, yeah, they're just all new young faces and I just don't know who they are. You must be the oldest jockey now, Richard Johnson's. Uh, I think I, I think I'm officially the oldest jump jockey with a license. Yeah. Still riding. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I'd have to get clarity on that, but I think, yeah, I think I am. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining me on the paddock and the pavilion this morning. It's been great fun. Um, you've certainly done things that, as you say, your CV would be different to <laughs> yeah, any, different, anyone, yeah. <laughs> anyone else. Um, well, are you still supporting Brighton and Hove Albion as well? I read that as well. Oh, yes, I am. I'm a season ticket holder. We, we're playing very well this season. Long may it continue. So, yes, it's it's very good being a Brighton fan at the minute. It's So, yeah, it's nice. We've got a brand new stadium. I was, I mean, I've been, the first stadium I can remember was the Goldstone Ground. That's been knocked down that's a Toys R Us and a carpet world now I think so then we was uh, <laughs> then we went to the Withdean Stadium which again that was very open to the elements so that was die hard fans only then we was at Gillingham which was a bit of a trek but now yeah now we've got the Amex which is fucking literally it's five minutes away from the doorstep it's it's a it's a great stadium and it's, yeah, it's, uh, as I say, it's very, very good being a Brighton fan at the minute. Well, thanks again. Ten years ago, I say you won the Hennessy, now the Labrooks trophy. You, you'll probably be on my TV in a, in a week's time. Fingers crossed. It, it's open. <laughs> Someone will remember it. It's ten years ago since uh, Matty Batchelor won the uh, Hennessy stroke Labrooks trophy. Go to the Labrook. Yeah, good days. Very good days. Well, thanks again for joining me. Thank you very much, Stephen. All the best. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Paddock and the Pavilion. You can download the show on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher and Spotify. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook at The Pad and Pad. Sports Social Podcast Network. How powerful is the Cox Network? So powerful that one day, the internet will let your doctor perform miracles from thousands of miles away. Connecting to remote operating room. Giving a whole new meaning to the term house call. Operation complete. The Cox Network. With gig speeds everywhere. It's internet built for tomorrow, today. Cox, bringing us closer. In Cox serviceable areas, speeds vary and are not guaranteed. Cox terms apply. Other restrictions may apply.